daily basis and just, you know, just hang out, do some cooking, chat. Um, we can also have it be like a AMA and keep it casual. Um, today we're going to be making dana noodles from the cookbook. I hope everyone has already gotten their copy of the cookbook, but if you haven't, that's okay. We, I think we sent out the recipe ahead of time. Is everyone going to be making the dish with us today? Hopefully some people. And if you don't, that's fine. You just hang out. It's very, very casual, as you can see. Okay. Are we still, what's happening, Elizabeth? Yeah, Are we're just adding, I've added, invited most people to panelists. Um, raise your hand if you want to be on video and you haven't gotten an invite yet. Um, and yeah, if you don't want to be on video, it's totally fine. I'm also going to work on getting this chat up and running. Thank you, Robert, Kamiko, Kathy. Appreciate y'all. Thank you all for dealing with us as we're trying to figure out a new platform here. Mm hmm. Hmm. Um, so Jing, I do have you spotlighted and then your iPhone right now is on the side, but let me add it as another spotlight. So we should be able to see two versions of Jing now. Okay. You you right. twice right now. <laughs> this is the only way I can show what kind of like what I'm working on. Um, <clears throat> hi everyone. It's great to see you guys. Um, welcome to our first uh, cook along, virtual cook along. So we're making dana noodles today. Um, Elizabeth is here with me. She is, do you want to quickly introduce yourself, Elizabeth? And what you'll I'm be doing? I'm a huge Fly by Jing fan and I'm our brand manager. Um, so this is our first little cooking class. We did one with Milk Street a month ago and it was super fun. Um, so we're hoping to make this a more regular series. So here, thank you for dealing with our roadblocks as we try out something new. Um, and yeah, Jing is here to make some Don Don noodles um, from her cookbook. If you guys haven't seen it yet, it's amazing. All the recipes in there are super delicious and super easy to make. Um, and I'm going to be making this for my dinner right after this. Great. And then do we have chat enabled? Because I do want people to be able to ask questions and interact. I'm working on that next. Right now we just have the Q&A. So if you have any comments that you want to give, feel free to put that in the Q&A while I work on getting the chat live. Okay. So for those of you who are, you know, in your kitchens ready to cook, so I'll just go over the ingredients first. Um, so Danda noodles, well, I'll, I'll kind of talk about Danda noodles first, maybe. I think it might be like one of the most famous dishes to come out of Citron. Right, like aside from oh yay, chat is live for panelists. So everyone needs to become a panelist, right? In order to type in the chat. So maybe if we just invite everybody. Okay. I've invited everyone to be a panelist, um, but I'm working on getting chat to work for everyone. Okay, great. Okay, you should yeah, be so everyone should now be able to chat. Check it, put a chat where you're from and see if that works. Yes, please say where you're from. We'd love to see where everyone is dialing in from. So Elizabeth is in- I'm in Colorado. Denver. Denver, Connecticut, <gasps> Vegas. Guess what? I'm in Vegas too. <laughs> Los Angeles, Portland, Knoxville, Pittsburgh, Wyoming. Wow, San Diego. Wow, we got such a diverse crew. New Jersey, San Francisco, Boston, Pacific Palisades, Bellevue, DC. So I just actually moved to Vegas a few weeks ago. I've been in LA for five years and, um, and I still, I'll, I'll be kind of splitting my time between the two places, but 
I'll go back to LA quite a bit. Um, a lot of our team is in LA. We're a fully remote company, but we have, when we have like 20 employees um, and half of them are in the LA area. So I'll be going back there a lot, but this is like my new kitchen um, just moved in not so long ago. So I actually don't have like most of my cooking stuff and <laughs> my bowls in place. I have like two of everything um, and that's it. So you might see me struggle a little bit, but um, yeah, I'm really liking it in Vegas so far. Today, we actually had a little pop-up at um, the Aria Resort for uh, for SWA, which for those of you who don't know, SWA is my new um, grab-and-go food concept that opened recently on Larchmont in LA. So that was really cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, I... I'm just going to be, I'm just going to start talking about Dundon noodles and we'll bear with me because I, you know, just got back home not long ago. I've got all my ingredients here. I'm going to actually be preparing it from scratch with all of you. Um, and Elizabeth will just be here chit-chatting with me. That's right. <laughs> We're going to chit-chat. I'm going to pin your other um, video so people can kind of see a side angle as you're like chopping. Okay, cool. And feel free, please, to like, you know. Jig's here for questions. We can't have this be a silent cooking show. So please yeah, bring exactly. on your questions about anything fly by Jing, Szechuan, <laughs> cooking. Um, she's an incredible chef and restaurateur. So bring the questions. Yeah. And if there's no questions, Elizabeth will have to ask me. I will them. start coming up with questions, which I have a lot always. Okay, awesome. So um done the noodles. Dana noodles, probably one of the most famous dishes to come out of Sichuan, I think after Mapo Tofu, or maybe, I don't know, what's more famous, Mapo Tofu, Kung Pao, chicken, Dana noodles, probably like those are the top three, I think. Um, and uh, it's actually like a street snack. So, I mean, you know, prior to having my version of it, Elizabeth, like, have you had a lot of other... Dandan noodles? Um, just in Sichuan restaurants. Um, I had never yeah. made it at home before getting the cookbook. Yeah. There's it's one of those dishes that I think there's so many different versions of it. Um people make it their own. There's different regional variations. I think in certain places like Taiwan, like they might add sesame paste. Um, it's like you know, even within Sichuan, there's many different versions of it. Ones that are super spicy, ones that are not. And, you know, it's uh, ones that are soupy, ones that are really dry and just saucy. So um, I'm going to make one that I think is like pretty classic from Chengdu. So the version that I make actually doesn't have sesame paste in it, but you can always substitute and, you know, add add your own if you want something a little bit more nutty and a little bit more um creamy and uh if you don't have sesame paste some people put peanut butter you know so you can really do a lot with it but this version i think is pretty classic and i think the thing that most defines dandan dan is the use of this um ingredient which not a lot of places do but it, it, it's like the most, I think, traditional version is this ingredient called Yatsai. So I found this at 99 Ranch. I don't know if you can see. So 99 Ranch, they have um, this in different forms. They have this in a box or in a little bag. And um, it's basically a preserved like mustard. What do they call it? It's, it just says green vegetable here, but it's a preserved like mustard tu tubers, something. And um, they preserve it with salt over a long period of time. And then it turns this like dark brown color. They, um, they wring it out. They let it dry in the sun for a really long time. So it's kind of like dried salted mustard greens. And um, it has like a really nice kind of bounce to the texture. So um, adds a nice little crunch which I think is really essential in this dish because everything else is like a little bit soft, like the noodles and the ground pork. 
Um, Real quick, um, Jing, Keith has a question. Do you ever make homemade noodles for this dish or do you always just buy noodles? Um, you know, you can. I think I have some recipes in here for homemade noodles. There's like a sweet water noodle that is that you can hand make. There's um, a hand pulled noodle uh, recipe. You can definitely do that. I am usually a lot lazier than that. And I just, you know, buy store bought. This one I got from 99 Ranch. It is like a nice kind of medium size um, noodle that's not too thick, not too thin, which I think I prefer for um, for dandan. This type of noodle is like a little bit harder to make. I think if you're going for like sweet water noodle, which is really thick, or um, or like biang biang noodle, like hand torn noodles, they are a lot more forgiving. You can have like really thick, you know, uneven oblong size pieces and it'll taste great. But for this, you know, typically you want uniform thickness of noodle, which is just like more, there's more to it. There's more craft to the pulling of the noodle. So I typically don't do that. Um, you definitely can if you want. And this brand is called Yaidu? What is this brand called? Yeah, you do. You do. Yeah. So there's so many different types. And honestly, um, I have no idea what all the differences are between them. You just kind of have to like try them all and see. Um, but this brand I see in pretty much all the stores and it's pretty consistent. So, um, and it's cute. So I like this. The one. cuteness is always where we got to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions? I can't see the questions for some reason. There's that's it for now. If anyone has any others, um, go for it. Okay. Oh, I love eight year olds that love fly by Jing. We were just at Aww. Costco last weekend and I was shocked at how many kids have an incredible spice tolerance. We are raising an incredible generation, everyone. These yes. spicy kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Someone actually told me that their teenage son loves to put Sichuan chili crisp in his cereal, which I did not expect to hear. <laughs> that was probably the wildest thing I've ever heard. Cereal with milk. Um, what section of the store is Yatsai found in? Um, it is usually in, uh, it doesn't need to be refrigerated, although I've seen it in the refrigerator. So it's usually in like, Kind of a section where pickles are you know like so the kind of dry good pantry condiment sort of section with pickles um but i also have seen it in the fridge in like a little packet she eats it with her shell and bow i love it so then sesame paste is a taiwanese addition um it's hard to say there's been so many variations over the last like century that this dish has been around and I'm sure you can probably find some version of it even in Sichuan. Um, I would say this version without sesame paste is the most classic version. It's like the most pared back classic version. Sesame paste seems like to be more of a newer thing that has evolved over time. Yours is moist, not dry. Yeah, it is. It, it is. Sorry, it is moist. So it's kind of like... It's dried out, so that creates the texture, but I think when they preserve it, when they put it um, in the bag, they put it in with some pickling liquid, so it is it is moist. Yes, you can use that. So if you got the same box, you're good. Okay, um, feel free to ask more questions about dana noodles. The name dana noodles came, comes from dan, which is kind of like a pole in Sichuan dialect, so, um, because it was a street food that was carried by these vendors on these baskets on a pole that they would like carry around town. So that just kind of evolved and that became the name of the noodles that they were selling out of the baskets. Um, yeah, so I talked about sumi, yatai. And then the other ingredient, of course, is um, citron pepper. So you can buy citron pepper, um, from most Asian stores, although typically they're not very fresh because, you know, it's one of those things, spices, you know, have a very short shelf life and, 
Um, and you also have to store it in the proper conditions. I usually keep my citron pepper in the freezer because the oils are so delicate. And, you know, if you put it in the freezer, it actually keeps it for a long time, especially because um, like ours is a really high quality citron pepper. And so a little bit goes a long way. So one packet will usually last me a really long time. So um, like if I'm going to like use it all in one go, which it will be crazy. I don't know what I would be making, you know, <laughs> being really fun. tingly, like really tingly. <laughs> um, I, you know, you wouldn't have to worry about that, but usually I, I store it in the freezer. So of course, when you go to the store, it's never in the freezer. It's like been sitting there maybe for years and you know, all the flavor has escaped, not to mention when it was packaged, it was probably already a low quality version. So, um, but depending on, you know, sometimes you can't find something better. And, you know, I mean, you can find this on our website and on Amazon, but sometimes, you know, if you're in a pinch, um, you, you just have to use a bit more. So when a recipe calls for a certain amount of citron pepper, kind of like, judge based on the quality and the age and the, you know, um, the state of your citron pepper that you have. So if you, and then adjust accordingly, right? Like if I say, I don't know what I said here. I said uh, one teaspoon, right? One teaspoon, you know, maybe if it's like an older version that you have, you might want to put more. Um, and if you have a really potent one, you might want to but even less. So just kind of adjust it to, to taste. Um, tan tan versus dan dan. Yeah. It's, it's literally just like a, just like a spelling difference. Like how people used to say Peking versus Beijing. Yeah. Um, so citron pepper, another essential ingredient and then soy sauce. So I hope everybody has both regular and a dark. So um, the difference between the two is regular, I think is a lot more common. It's like the one I use a lot more. Um, it's a lot more salty. It's, it's, it's quite savory. The, um, the darker one is typically like a thicker soy sauce and it's, um, less salty and, uh, thicker and, and kind of darker in color. So usually, the way that it's used is actually to add color in a dish rather than add saltiness. So, but this recipe kind of calls for both. All right. Any questions about anything so far? Um, can we talk about the noodles again? Um, yeah. So does this need to be a specific type of noodle or is it could kind of like any wheat noodle work? Susan is wondering. Um, Any wheat noodle will work, right? I mean, Dan Dan, like the, the the traditional dish is a kind of a thin noodle okay so that's why I got this one right um but again the components of tandan is ground pork yatsai noodles and the sauce so if you have all the other components and you want to sub in a different type of noodle of course you can do that you know it's just not what's traditionally served in Sichuan um and I think you know there's different types of noodles have different like mouthfeel, right? So when you put it, when you are chewing on it, along with, you know, all the, all the components together, um, like a knife cut noodle or a, or a wide ripply kind of noodle will just have a different texture from a thin noodle. So it's really up to you at the end of the day, like, you know, what's most important to me, I think, is getting the flavor profile right. And then, you know, what you put it on is up to you. And Grace, we totally hear you. Like if we said this is our first time trying Zoom webinars, we did put like an ingredient list and a link to the recipe in those Zoom reminders. Um, but I totally get it if that was went to your spam or you didn't see it. So next time we're going to look at other options for uh, doing these. But if so, everyone knows, I just put in the chat um, the noodle recipe we're going to be making, um, and that has all the ingredients there. And then everyone will get a recording of this, probably including the first three minutes where we didn't know you all were here. Um, so you can rewatch that for your enjoyment later. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I am going to start on some of the first steps here. 
Yeah, we did send out, we got like, I, I think I saw two emails that came through with reminders and with the ingredient list, but because it came from Zoom, it might've gone to people's spam. But um, all right, so the first step is to start with the topping. So the topping is basically um, you want some neutral oil. You want to be able to fry up your pork. Then there is ground pork or or actually beef. I'm using pork today. Um, so about quarter of a pound of ground beef or pork, two tablespoons of the yibing yatsai, uh, one teaspoon of light soy sauce and one teaspoon of dark soy sauce. And that's it. And you kind of just fry that up. So I'm going to get that going over here. I'm going to switch your camera. Yeah, I can actually put this I think, here. Okay, we're now on a uh, stove view. Okay, great. All right. So, actually, I have this uh, avocado oil spray that I just got, so I'm going to use this. Um, Keith is wondering if you could use seafood instead of like pork. Um, <laughs> you can use whatever you want. Uh, this is just, it'll just taste different. It'll be different. It'll be a seafoody. You know, I mean, I don't know what kind of seafood you're thinking. It could be um, some kind of dried seafood maybe because the point of this, the point of the pork, I guess, is to add texture. And so what we're doing right now is we're frying the pork. We're frying the pork so that it'll get a little crispy. It'll get a little dried out. Like the pork is not meant to be like super juicy. I think typically uh, the way that I've had it, it's like they fry it for a while, right? With the um, with the oil and the soy sauce and the pickles. And it's like a little bit, it's, it's more for the texture. So when you say seafood, I'm thinking like- He's thinking like oysters or shrimpies, specifically shrimpies. Sh Oysters or shrimpies, I would say like dried versions of them, right? Like, you know, if you go to like the Chinese market, they usually have these dried bins of like seafood. Um, so yeah, I would do that. Sure. Um, so that's like if you don't eat pork or beef. Yeah, sure. I think like even the like dried little bits of dried scallop. The only thing I'd be careful with is those dried seafood um pieces are typically a little salted because they preserve it in salt. So it's quite salty. So that's the only thing. The other thing you can do is just take, yeah, I mean, drained chopped clams. The other thing you can do is take like firm tofu, right? Squeeze all the water out of it. Tofu crumbles if you're like a vegetarian or something. All right. <sighs> Let's see. We got some pork. Um, I'm like, not going to really measure because we've done this. <laughs> this isn't your first time. Feel free to measure. What's wild about Zoom. It's like, I can't even hear your hood fan on. It's wild. My, oh, I, um, my phone camera here. Does not, great. It does not sound on. Oh, okay. Great. Love that. But also the hood fan is off. So that's all you don't hear. Yeah, there you go. Oh, Alex got some plant-based ground beef. That will totally work. That's an easy sub. Oh, yeah. Obviously, yeah. Beyond. It's like impossible and beyond. That's also a thing, it turns out. Uh, okay. So I'm gonna put in, this is, I like these creative ideas. I like, want to try it with the dried shrimpies. I vote. Uh, is the dried shrimpy question because of, like, they eat seafood but not meat? That where I don't know, Keith. Only you can answer this. Okay, because that I think if you do eat meat, it's like a nice addition too. You know, like um, he says yes. Yes. Okay. So you're saying you could do pork and shrimpies? Yeah, I think the shrimp. Let's go. The dry shrimp um will add a really nice like 
Oh no, what happened? Ah. Your phone, did your phone like die? No, I clicked the wrong thing. Hold on. I like. There we are. We're back. We're back. You're back. Oh, that's a great idea, Kamiko. Sauteed mushrooms instead of tofu or like beyond or impossible meat too. They will brown really well. Wait, what happened to Jing's audio? Guys. <laughs> You're back. Make one of them on mute. Okay, but do you still see the other one? I think I lost the other one. I don't know how to do this. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> So, oh, maybe I just go join? Try to just join. Thanks, guys, for bearing with us. I promise this recipe is worth it. Oh, no, no, no. I got it. Hold on. Susan, water chestnuts. You guys are blowing my mind for the not the veggie options. You could totally use water chestnuts. Okay. So what I'm doing here, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. We can see you. It's going to be spotlit. There we go. Jess is getting hungry. So what I'm doing here is I'm like breaking up the pork so that oh, it's starting to smell really good. So I'm breaking up the pork so it can be like little pieces and not just like giant chunks. And then um, I'm going to put a bit of the yatai in, so about two tablespoons. So the yatai is, um, you can eat it straight, but like if you cook it, because it's, it's preserved and, you know, cooking it is, is typically better. It also gets like more flavor out of it. Um, so just stir frying it in oil. We'll do the trick. <clears throat> so you can see this area. So Myrna's wondering why not use a wok? You can use a wok. I just didn't pack a wok. I don't know what's happening. Why is it balloon? What is going on? You can use a wok. I um I just moved to Vegas, so um, my kitchen is a little bit sparse right now. So this is uh all I got. But, you know, it goes to show you that even if you don't have a wok and you don't have a proper spatula, you just have a rubber spatula, you can still make something work. All right, it's starting to smell really, really good with the yakai, like together with the pork. Okay, so I'm going to put in a little bit of the soy sauce. So again, we've got... Um, a light soy sauce and a dark one. Huh? Oh, I can see it sizzling. Um, Brad had as a question I've never heard before, but he saw a recipe that you when you added water when breaking up the pork, it gave the pork a better texture. Do you know anything about that? Um, I do not know anything about that. That's a that's intriguing. Where... Someone try and comment about whether or not it works if you're cooking the pork right now. Okay. Brad, so... Brad is that your go-to? Does it work? Does it work? I mean, you should try that and let me know how it's working. Okay, so as you can see, it's like really getting nice and brown. And then the soy sauce is adding a really nice fragrance to it as well. So you kind of just like put your... Um, stove on, I guess it's like medium, medium high heat. And what you want to do is keep cooking this until you're happy with the texture. So what you're looking for is, is texture. You want like, you know, you don't want the meat to be like soft and stuff. You want it to be maybe a little crispy at the edges, but it is really up to you, whatever you prefer. 
Um, so I can't see if people are. So Aaron wants to know, do you have to use both dark and light soy sauce? Um, yes. I mean, the light soy sauce is for the flavor, is for the saltiness. The dark soy sauce is for the color. You're not going to get the same dark color with the light soy sauce as much. However, if you don't have one or the other, you're fine. Like, it's still going to taste good. Um, the thing is, the 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 yachts high, the pickles are already pretty salty, right? It's a salty preserved vegetable. Um, so you're, you know, like if you don't have the light soy sauce, it's not going to be the, the end of the world. If you don't have the dark one, what I would do is maybe like cook the meat a little bit longer so then the meat is browned, you know? Um, with the dark soy sauce, you know, you can maybe cook it a little shorter and and um, it'll still have the color. So, yeah. Love it. Mm, okay. All right, so it's starting to smell really good. starting to dry out. And as you can see, what I have in the pan looks a little less than what I started with, which is good. All right. Okay, so while that's cooking, I'm gonna fill up my, um, my pot that I'm gonna be boiling my noodles with, with some water just to get that started. And then while the water's boiling, we will make our sauce. Most important part, the sauce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do the magnets on your fridge mean, Jing? Oh. <laughs> um, so, like much happiness, much joy. Okay. Tang an, I actually don't know what that third character is. I was gonna ask my parents. Um, this is also the traditional Chinese characters. So like in Chinese characters, there's like the traditional and then there's the modern version. So I was uh -huh. taught the version, this is the traditional. So I actually don't recognize that third character. Does anyone else know on this chat? Someone tell something us please. Long piece, something. That's what know. we want. That's all we want. Yeah. Much joy and long peace. <laughs> I love that. Okay. So this is starting to dry out really nicely. You can see like the all the amazing texture. I want to be there right now. Ugh, it smells I want so this for dinner. Okay. So I'm going to um, put this water here to boil. You can salt the water like you would pasta water like salty as the sea that kind of vibe yeah why not noodles that salt salt liberally oh, they operate the same as pasta right so okay you told me something i had never thought about before but that like, like italians got pasta from china originally and i literally had never thought about that before I told you that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Well, then it is true. Um, <laughs> I, you know, people debate that, but actually it's, I mean, I think it's true. Like Marco Polo, right? Brought noodles through the Silk Road to the West from China. So wild. I love that. That's where noodles, and that's where pasta comes from, right? Um, but yeah, there's, I mean, I feel like when something is invented, it often happens at the same time in many different places. It's yeah. just time for it to be born, you know? So oh, wow. I don't know exactly if noodles came from China but went to Italy, but I think I think it did. If there's oh, any historians yeah. on this chat, you can tell us. Okay, so I've turned off the heat on my pork because I think it's done. Um, it's still sizzling a little bit, but I'm just going to keep it here. And um, now my water is flowing for the noodles. And I'm going to, ah, I'm going to come back 
and start working on my sauce. Okay. All right. You want to be just <gasps> the phone? What is it? Do you want to be just the phone? Are you going to be down on the cutting board? Um, you can do both, maybe. Okay, do both. No, why not? Um, Miko okay. says that we are correct. Thank you. We're correct. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the documentaries don't lie to us. No. Yeah, there's um. But I, I I think something else I've learned recently is that like pepper. I never thought about this. That peppers came from South America to China. Oh, well, that is what? yeah, that is for sure. So basically, um, what a lot of people don't know, but I do talk about this in the book, is that Sichuan food, Chinese food, was not always spicy. Uh, in fact, as little as like 200 years ago or 100 and yeah roughly 200 years ago um that's when chili peppers were first introduced to china via trading routes and a lot of people think it came in from kind of the silk road like the like land trading routes but it actually came in from like maritime trading routes and it came in through eastern china and what's really fascinating is that in Eastern China, till this day, they don't like spice, right? They don't have a lot of heat in their cooking and they never adopted it. So it came in and then it just never took off for a really long time. And then a while later, somehow it like trickled down into the Southwest part of China and um, it just took on like wildfire. I think in Sichuan in particular, um, the climate is really humid and muggy. And uh, according to traditional Chinese medicine, you know, if you have that type of climate, um, your body sort of develops this, what they call internal dampness. It sounds really funny. <laughs> like when, when you go to like any traditional Chinese medicine kind of practitioner or acupuncturist, they're most likely gonna tell you you're too damp. Um, and uh, what you need to do to dispel the dampness is to sweat it out. And so for a really long time, people would um, would uh, eat like different forms of heating foods that would enable you to sweat out, you know, your health issues. And uh, before chili peppers came to China, it used to be things like ginger. And there was this like type of berry actually don't know what the English name is, that um, they would eat and, and different types of spices. Sichuan pepper is indigenous to Sichuan and that has always been in Sichuan. But um, when the chili pepper came in, like it just took off because people were like, oh my God, this is what we've been looking for. And also it happens to pair really well with Sichuan pepper. The two, and that's how we got like this mala flavor profile that's so popular. The two really got on really well because um, I mean, people in Sichuan say that, you know, the, the numbingness and the tingliness of the Sichuan pepper actually numb your palate so that you can eat more spice, eat more heat. And then uh, th that makes you sweat. And, you know, it's just the combination of the two is like almost like a delirious effect. Um, and it's really addicting. Right. Like chili peppers, we know it actually like um, it actually like gives you kind of a rush to the brain, like a rush of serotonin to the brain. And actually it is a, an addictive substance. <laughs> so once people um, it makes you happy and then it gives you that hit. And so once people like get their palates expanded by chili peppers, you kind of can't turn back. Like I have a hard time eating anything without a little bit of spice, a little bit of heat. Right. So, you know, and it, and it takes practice and it takes some time, but anyway, sauce. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the sauce is the components of the sauce. Uh, usually it's a chili oil. Okay. I use chili crisp. I use our chili crisp because I use it a lot as a shortcut to all kinds of recipes. And if you have my book, you'll see it come up again and again and again. And obviously, obviously like in the traditional Sichuan recipe, it doesn't call for fly by Jing Sichuan chili crisp, 
But what it does when you use um, this product is that it, um, it, it's an instant shortcut because we have 18 different ingredients in here. We've got so much stuff that's already like, we've done the work to kind of develop the flavor over time, right? So the fermented black beans in here is an element of time as an ingredient, right? You can't just like get that overnight. Um, the blend of different chilies, the blend of oils. So the oil that we use here is a Sichuan rapeseed oil. Now, I hate calling it rapeseed oil because there's such a misunderstanding or conflation of what oil is with European rapeseed. And, you know, a lot of people think rapeseed is canola and it's not. I mean, they come from the same plant originally, but canola is like, you know, artificially kind of derived. It's called canola because the Canadian government invented it. And it's like, it ends up being a very different product. Um, Sichuan rapeseed is cold pressed. It's roasted seeds. It's an, a, a whole different strain of the rapa, brassica rapa plant um, that has a different health profile. It, um, and it's pr not processed in the same way that like European rapeseed oils are. So in Sichuan, this rapeseed oil is roasted. It's beautiful. It's been used for literally thousands of years. Um, and it has this like really beautiful nutty flavor. And that is what defines, I think, our product. And um, it's really hard to find in the U.S. Like you basically can't find Sichuan rapeseed oil in the U.S. And so... Again, all these reasons why I think, you know, you can use a homemade chili oil. You can use a store-bought chili oil. But with this, you're just getting that, like, additional flavor, you know, an impact right away. So that is a component of the sauce. We have four tablespoons of that, two tablespoons. And by the way, we're making four servings. This is, like, measurements for four servings. So if you were to just do like one serving for yourself, you would divide everything by four. You would just need one tablespoon of chili crisp, one uh, or half a tablespoon of soy sauce, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, but this way, you know, you can like kind of batch make enough for four people. And I will also add that this portion size is not like a whole meal. So typically done on noodles and other Sichuan street snacks are served in like small bowls so that you can have it as a snack and you can have like two small bowls you know or if you want you can have a giant bowl um so but this is like enough for four snack size portions okay <clears throat> or I guess like for two people it could be like a more hefty meal um all right so four tablespoons of chili crisp two tablespoons of light soy sauce two tablespoons of dark soy sauce uh, one teaspoon of citron pepper, and then more for um, garnish, and four tablespoons of thinly sliced uh, green parts of scallions. Okay. Well, so starting to make that, Keith had the great idea that he uses the Szechuan chili crisp as a marinade or a rub on a duck days before cooking. That's a cool mm -hmm. idea. Yes, I love when I hear about, you know, all the ways that people use Sichuan chili crisp. Um, yeah, I love cooking with it. I think, you know, it's it's so much more than just a condiment. The, so I don't know if everyone knows, like, how I started Fa Bai Jing, but I started it as, um, it's not very sharp but we'll make <laughs> new house not good knives <laughs> yeah she's gonna get a knife christmas present <laughs> yeah, need to start putting my knives i literally just moved in not so long ago so okay i'm gonna use this so um i started fly by jing as an underground supper club so i was doing dinners and pop-ups in cities all over the world and um all of what you see now as our sauces actually started out as components of my dishes. So if you look at my cookbook, a lot of these dishes are like, okay, this calls for some chili crisp. This calls for mala spice and jong sauce and stuff. 
And um, those were basically flavor basis for a lot of my dishes. And because I was doing this like underground supper club where I was doing pop-ups in cities all over the world, I, um, you know, I had to carry uh, suitcases of ingredients with me because these ingredients were essential to bringing the flavors of citron to life, right? And they were not available anywhere outside of China. So when I would go to like New Zealand and I would go to New York, LA, you know, Japan even, like I had to bring these things with me. And, you know, at first I was like carrying the raw ingredients and then I was like, okay, to save time, I'm just gonna pre-batch a lot of the sauces. Um, and uh, carry it basically in like giant containers or like bags with me. <laughs> um, and I like, hope that it gets through customs. So that's how the sauces came about because people started like asking for it. And, you know, I started bottling some of the compound sauces. And um, so my point here is that I did not develop citron chili crisp as a condiment. I developed it as like a, not a condiment that you just like, like a hot sauce you just put on food, but rather it was, it was a component of dishes. So it was like a cooking sauce, you know? So it just so happens that you can also eat it straight. You don't have to cook with it. Um, Brad but, is saying he puts it in Bloody Marys all the time, which I actually haven't tried, but that sounds so good. Brad, have you tried the Bloody Mary recipe? Or it's a Bloody the Caesar. Because I'm Caesar. Canadian. So <laughs> I love a Caesar. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of mixologists actually use it in cocktails. And I love it in a drink. We have a spicy Paloma drink as well, I think, in the recipes. Um, yeah. Caesar. Yeah. All right. So I just chopped up my scallions. This is roughly four tablespoons, I guess, more or less. All right. And then I'm going to get a little bowl. Start mixing up my sauce. This bowl here. Make sure that you mix your chili crisp well. All you know, be the beauty of chili crisp is the, the texture, right? And all the different bits in it. And you know, if you leave it sitting for a while, it's gonna sink to the bottom. And um, you know, sometimes people are like, oh my God, there's not enough crisp. I need more crisp. There's too much oil. The thing is the oil and the crisp ratio is designed so that if you do mix it every single time and mix it well, um, it's the perfect ratio. And, um, you know, you don't want to be left with a bunch of oil and no crisp or a bunch of crisp and no oil. And I think sometimes like some products that you see out there is like too much crisp. And like, we have our product Tundu Crunch, right? Which is very crispy, very crunchy. That's different. It's for a different purpose. I view that as more of like a pure condiment, right? Like you're not gonna necessarily cook with a bunch of nuts and seeds and beans. Sorry, no nuts, there's no nuts in the product. But um, this is like a hot sauce. You know, you want it to be consistent every time. And so if you do mix it up every single time, when you get down to the bottom of the jar, there shouldn't be an excess of one or the other. So it's designed with the perfect kind of balance in mind, okay? so. Always mix your chili crisp. What was the idea behind the crunch? Yes, great question. Okay, so the crunch is, um, for those of you who don't know, Chengdu Crunch is the latest product that we just launched. You can find it actually exclusively on our website. Uh, or maybe we launched it on Amazon recently as well. <laughs> Um, we should have like a, I mean, everyone here's a tastemaker already, right? So like, or maybe not everyone's a tastemaker. We did do a limited edition promo code for our cookbook bundle, which does have Chengdu crunch in it, um, just for attendees. So I'll put that in the chat. Okay. So if you're a tastemaker and get 20% off everything on the website 
at all times. So that's why I asked. Um, but yeah, so Chandu Crunch. It's actually like um, so if you if you're familiar with like Mexican salsa matchas, um, and this brings us back to our earlier conversation of like how chili peppers got to China. It actually came in through Mexico. And I've always been really struck by the um similarities between Sichuan cuisine in particular and Mexican cuisine, especially like I traveled, I've traveled a lot of places in Mexico. I love Oaxaca. And um I've done like, you know, lots of tours of mezcal distilleries and you know found that mezcal there's a lot of similarities between mezcal and like chinese baijiu which is like chinese liquor um in the sense that you know i mean mezcal is obviously made with agave but like in china the spirit is made from grains but it's fermented in a very similar way so it kind of has that fermented funk that's very similar and then you've got obviously chilies, the similarities of different chilies. Um, and uh, I would say like Argentile chilies, which is like the dominant chili in our chili sauce, and also the most popular form of chili in Sichuan is probably similar to like a chili de arbol or something like that. Um, but anyway, where I was going with that was that Chandu Crunch might remind you of like some salsa matchas that you, you see in, in Mexico. And uh, salsa mash is usually more like nuts and seeds. Like they put almonds and, you know, I don't know what other seeds are there, like pumpkin seeds and, and pumpkin seeds all kinds of stuff, kind of dried fruit. Um, but for us, and, and, and then in Sichuan, there's also um, a version that is has been around for a long time. And, and I when I was growing up, I would try this, you know, they would call it like five seed sauce, you know, or, um, I mean, there's just so many different versions out there. Everybody has a different one. Um, but uh, I've always been so curious, like, how is it so crunchy? How do they, I mean, it's preserved in oil. It's like a chili sauce. I mean, I would always love to put it on my congee or rice bowls, whatever. And um, it was always something I wanted to crack. And this past trip home, uh, I think it was August when I was in Chengdu. We finally April. figured out. April. Actually, no, it was April. It was the first yeah, trip yeah. back. Yes. So as soon as um, they lifted the travel restrictions, my team and I, we went to Chengdu and um, worked really hard with the R&D department of our, uh, of our co-manufacturer and we cracked this. But the reason behind it, you know, it's just something that I've always loved. I always just, the way I develop products, I just like develop what I like and trust that other people will like it too. And um, with this one, you know, uh, I was trying to figure out how do we make a crispier version of the chili crisp. There, I think um, the reason why our chili crisp is the texture that it is, uh, is because of the ingredients in it. So for me, what's really important here is the flavor. And for me, the black beans is a big contributor to the flavor. Black beans have moisture in it. And it wasn't, it was not negotiable for me to take the black beans out. Because I think it, it that funk from it adds such a special flavor and is so distinct from anything else that anyone else is making on the market, right? So for me, um, the black bean was essential to our core Citron Chili Crisp product, but we realized that that was what makes it or prevents it from being even crispier. And so it was just through like a process of like R&D working on it and stuff that we figured out, okay, can we just like start with a completely different product? Like I would say Chengdu Crunch is like a completely different class of product, right? But just to like, for people to understand more easily, we say it's like extra crunchy version of Chili Crisp, but it is a very different product altogether. So we started with um, the crunch. So what are the elements of it? We've got fava beans. Fava beans is a very popular um, protein source in Sichuan. And it's so delicious. And so 
started with fava beans, then soybeans, yellow split peas, um, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, sesame seeds, and then figured out what is the optimal oil temperature? What is the um, optimal kind of process to for each of these different ingredients? Because they're all processed differently. They're all different sizes. They're different constitution. So you have to kind of cook them differently in order to get them each to the right crispiness level. And then you combine it all, add the flavoring. Um, so it took us a long time, but we figured it out. And that's the story. So if you're wondering like, how did we come up with that product? That's the story. And um, yeah, I'm so glad that you guys like it. It's, I think the most difficult, but also the most like rewarding and exciting product that we have put out since chili crisp um a lot you of people also have... did it so fast it's pretty unreal that like you came up with it and started testing it in april and then we came out right with it and we have our um tastemakers to think yeah do you want to tell them why so um for tastemakers which is kind of like our membership club for people with good taste uh, we sent out um, in august about 700 samples of chengdu crunch to tastemakers um, and in exchange for that, they answered a very robust survey that probably took them at least 10 minutes. Um, and that's actually what helped us to decide on the name Chengdu Crunch because we were debating a couple names internally. Um, and they gave us a lot of really good feedback about what they were expecting, what they weren't expecting. Um, it's super, super crunchy, but it's actually nut free. So people were like, I think I'm sure I'm positive there's peanuts in it. And so we've tried to be like really clear that there are no peanuts in it, um, even though because like a lot of us um, in America might not be used to having like roasted soybeans or fava beans in like a condiment. So the thing that we think of most is like a roasted peanut. Um, so it's it was so fun. And we are working right now on a brand new innovation for another condiment that's totally different. Um, and our tastemakers will get to try that first, too, and give us some feedback. Mm hmm. Yeah, so we're really grateful to everyone who helped us really expedite kind of our um, process to get this to market. And sorry, I just added in a little bit of sesame oil into the sauce as well. It doesn't call for it in the recipe, but you kind of you want. I like it a little bit uh, more fragrant with the sesame oil. Um, all right, so this is kind of the texture. There's a lot of scallions. There's a lot of scallions. I like scallions. Um, you can you can pair back on the scallions if you don't love how oniony it is, but that's it. I basically, while Elizabeth was talking, I put in four tablespoons of chili crisp. I put in uh, two tablespoons of um, dark and two tablespoons of light soy sauce, um, the scallions, and then some citron pepper, which I've already roasted and ground but just to talk you through that the way that you use the citron peppers because we sell them whole because you want spices whole if you grind it up if it's like sold ground already it's already lost its flavor like simply just it's gone um so what you want is the whole spice and then you want to roast it it's really important to roast it because then you are releasing the fragrance, the oils of the uh, of the actual spice. So once you roasted it, grind it, and only roast and grind as much as you need every time. Don't do it in like a huge batch because it will lose its flavor over time. All right. So that's it. That's the sauce. Easy, and my easy. water. Huh? Sorry. Easy. Yeah. Easy. Great. All right. Now my water is finished boiling. I'm going to put my noodles in. Um, so roughly a pound. This is about a pound. It's a lot of noodle. <laughs> All right. Might be too much noodle. Okay, let's see. Um, Don is wondering if he should roast the peppers in the oven or a pan. How do you usually roast your peppers, Jing? Um, 
I would just toast it because it takes no time. It literally, because the peppers are so small. Um, if you just put your uh, stove onto like a light heat and put a pan over it, it will literally toast in less than a minute. I'll say like a minute, maybe if that half a minute, depending on how high the heat is. Um, and you want to be careful to not burn it as well, because then it turns bitter and it doesn't it lose all the flavor. Um, so just a pan. Yeah. And just like keep your eye on it and literally just like move it around a little bit until it's warm and you can smell the fragrance released. Yeah. Sweet. All right. So just cooking my noodle right now. <laughs> my mom has been cooking along live and she has sent me a picture of her finished dish and it looks so good. And I'm so jealous. Oh. So I am so slow. You guys, if you're, you're uh, kind of telling us a lot of information. <laughs> <laughs> Food historian, chef, entrepreneur, restaurateur. <laughs> Get this woman a documentary so she can share all the knowledge, please. Who else has a question while the noodles are boiling? So you guys the question, what if you blended the chili crust so it was smooth and then would it be horrible? Or would it separate because of the oil? I, I mean, there's so never much. never blended it. Yeah, yeah. That's definitely been something we've considered. But there's so much like particulates in it that even if you blended it, first of all, you're losing the texture. Right, like the, the magic of chili crisp is the texture and is the distinct pieces. Um, second, uh, if you blended it, actually it would affect the flavor as well because it would start to taste really muddy. I don't know how else to describe it. It would be like, because all the black beans and the all the different ingredients will blend together. It'll just be like mushy and muddy. The, then the flavor itself will be really, um, It'll just get lost. Okay, so real quick, what I'm doing is I'm gonna separate, I'm actually just gonna make two big bowls because uh, I don't have four people to feed. Um, so I'm gonna divide the sauces evenly and then divide the noodles on top of this bowl. I definitely overcooked the noodles because I was too busy. <laughs> we were chatting. Um, but that's okay. That is okay. Uh, what was I saying? What were we talking about? Sriracha dumplings? Ooh, I like this name. The Jing Zing. The Jing Zing? Yeah. <laughs> I like that too, but you know what? There's already a company out there that copied us and called themselves Zing. So <laughs> we have we have Zing and then we have Hot Jiang. Oh my god, there's so many copycats. Copycats. You guys know who's real. You guys know who's real. But there's literally one called Zing. I think they're based I can't. in Canada. I can't. Canadian on Canadian crime. I know. So, Can you believe? So rude. Can you believe? You guys are supposed to be nice i know right okay so i've got my noodles now i'm gonna just divide my meat topping on top of each bowl and and that's it this is like super easy this is a super easy recipe as long as you have the ingredients um okay so this is kind of what it looks like that looks so good yeah giant bowls of noodles here and i'll save some scallions i'm gonna just put it on top a little garnish and then a little bit more citron pepper and voila, that's it. Oh, Yay. it looks so good. I'm so jealous. Also, I just realized we're like way over the yeah. hour that we're <laughs>
<laughs> that's okay. I'm glad that you guys stuck around. Well, every, I think two people dropped, which is incredible. You guys are really sticking with it. Does yeah. anyone want to show us what you made? I can I can pin your spotlight if you if you want to share. There's 33 of us. Um, Sue, we, she got those noodles at 99 Ranch. You can also get them at H Mart, Amazon, um, any like Asian grocery store should have. Th those were Yai Yaidu brand, um, but any thin wheat noodle will work. Yeah. Oh, Keith, what kind of beer or wine should go with this, Jing? <gasps> oh, I mean, beer, any kind of beer, really like a light kind of beer would go well with citron food because it's just so refreshing. In China, I don't know if you've ever been to China, but like Chinese beers are notoriously light, like so much so that it's like drinking water. Um, but it's actually <laughs> like once you're there, you're like, get into it. Like it's actually pretty, uh, pretty refreshing, you know. Um, so the lighter the beer, I think the better. Wines, typically people pair Rieslings with Sichuan food because like it just goes better with the spicy flavors. Um, but champagne is really good. Anything sparkling. Oh, it's so good. It smells amazing. So mix it all up. Make sure, you know, you get the meat topping in everywhere. Um, and each bite should have like a really even like nice distribution of sauce the pickles, the meat, and the noodles. Okay, I'm going to try it. Looks so good. Mmm. It's not too bad. It's not too soft, I mean, the, the noodles. Thank God. And again, you can, like, adjust a lot of this, you know? This is, like, kind of just one version of it. If you want a little bit more nuttiness, you know, um, add the sesame paste, add peanut butter if you don't have sesame paste, or tahini. I prefer Chinese sesame paste because um, it's roasted. Tahini is usually unroasted sesame paste. What? You know? I, didn't, I didn't know that, actually. Well, what yeah, are you using like, tahini? tahini? You're like such a white person. God. Tahini is like really pale, right? Yeah. yeah, and yeah. If you compare that to the Chinese version, Chinese version is always like darker brown. And uh, I think it's better flavor. Mm -hmm. Yes, Aaron. You can top it with Trundle Crunch for extra crunch. <laughs> yes. Uh, this can definitely clear out your sinuses. Mm, yeah. What else? What else should we talk about? Any other questions you want to ask Jing while we're here? Any, if you want to show your dish, raise your hand and I'll unmute you. And feel free to provide feedback too. Like, yeah, you know, should we do 